Hello and welcome to the How To Carnivore podcast. I'm your host, Simon Lewis, and you're tuning into the Plant Free MD series with Dr. Anthony Chafee. Dr. Chafee is a surgeon, nutritional researcher, and former pro rugby player. He's been strict carnivore for three years and an on and off carnivore for more than 20. Dr. Chafee looks and feels like a real life superhero. If losing fat, building muscle, finding focus, and getting the most out of life is important to you, you're going to love the Plant Free MD series. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Plant Free MD series with Dr. Chafee. Today we've got a really special topic uh, which we've touched on a little bit but haven't gone to depth on. Uh, it's Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, so uh, Dr. Chafee, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah. All right, this is a, a really interesting topic because uh, it's terrifying for me and I'm sure for everyone else the thought of losing our minds either prematurely or even just losing our minds full stop because mm -hmm. not everyone goes um kind of gaga before they before they pass away uh, and you and I have, have touched on on a few ideas about Alzheimer's and nutrition before uh, it'd be really mm -hmm. cool to dive into that a little bit more um so I mean where do you want to start maybe we can start with kind of a, a, a lowdown on what Alzheimer's and dementia are? So, yeah, well, I mean, there'd be sort of two types of, uh, two, two different things, but, you okay. know, Alzheimer's can cause a, a type of dementia. Dementia would just be a neurodegenerative process where your, your brain is just physically uh, or functionally uh, devolving. So it's not as efficient and effective as it, as it was. And it could be for a variety of different reasons. Um, one of the reasons, obviously, is Alzheimer's. You can also get this with Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative uh, issues. The the ones that that uh, are are pertinent to this discussion would be the ones that I believe are reversible, or at least preventable, and partially reversible uh, through diet and lifestyle. Uh, at, at a certain point, damage is done. You you can harm yourself, and that can sometimes lead to permanent damage. But you can certainly reverse a lot of that. And I've certainly seen that in, in patients and family members. And also the, there have been studies that looked at a high fat ketogenic diet um, as a treatment modality for Alzheimer's. And that actually showed uh, better, better results than every single Alzheimer medication that's ever been trialed. So that's certainly uh, something that can be influenced by this. Now, can you reverse all the damage? You know, not in all cases, but it's certainly going to improve your situation dramatically. Um, and then there's just other other forms of dementia. People can just slow down over the years. We see on MRIs and CT scans when we're looking at patients for other reasons. Uh, you know, the brain of a of a young healthy person, it you know, it's very full. The skull is full of brain, and you have ventricles, which are the hollow portions inside the brain that that your cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, is created and flows through. And these are very tight and small, generally, in a young, healthy brain because the rest is just full of brain. Then when you get older and older and you see older and older brains, those spaces open up wider and wider and wider. And you know this is because the brain is atrophying. And it's just like if you have muscles that are just, just slowly withering away, your brain does that as well. Mm. But you know, so you can have someone who doesn't have dementia per se, but their brain is not the same as it was when, when they were 35 or even 40. So that's, that's a, a big issue. And I think that a lot of that has to do with diet and partially to do certainly a lot to do with what we're eating, but very importantly, what we're not eating. Everyone's going, you know, whenever, whenever you get into the, in your forties and you have a couple of kids, you think, oh, I need to protect my heart. I want to, you know, be there for my kids and my family. So they go on a low fat, you know, supposedly heart healthy diet and everyone starts getting problems. Their blood pressure starts going up their, uh, you know, their coronary calcium starts going up and they start having more and more problems. And this is, and then their doctors generally say, well, well this is because you were eating all those steaks for the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Well, no, because they weren't having any problems when they were eating the steaks, they were actually very well and very healthy. Then when they stopped doing that, they got a lot worse. And so 
you have these people in these, these elderly care communities and so forth. I see it in the hospital all the time. We have the dietary guidelines and recommendations for our patients. And I've actually emailed the hospital and, uh, and the, and the you know, health network multiple times saying like, well, look, you know, I, I think there's, there's some significant flaws with this, all pushing high carbohydrates, even high sugar and low fat, low meat sort of diets. And I see these people basically eating sugary cereal and candied bread. And, and these people are in hospital. I mean, it's like, and I just look at that and it's like, that's why they're in hospitals because they're, you know, they've been eating this crap. Mm, so, inside. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the main thing with, with eating a low fat diet and why that affects your brain is because your, your brain is made out of fat. And, you know, and, uh, you know, 70% of your solid components of your brain are lipids, fats, 20% of those are DHA. And so, and then you have e EPA and all these sorts of things that, that don't exist in plants because you can't get from plant oil, certainly not seed oils and all that rubbish. And so you need to get this from animal fats. They also have very long chain fatty acids, 20 and 22 chain uh, fatty acids. And these don't exist in plants and we don't really make them ourselves. We're very inefficient and ineffective at making them. We have to get this from our food source. And so if you're not getting them from meat, you're not getting them and your brain is deprived. And so you, you cannot maintain your, the structure, the physical structure of your brain, because every minute that we stay awake, we get low grade brain damage. And as your neurons are firing, they actually damage themselves. And this is why we need to sleep. This is why we need to shut off. This is why our brain cycles, which neurons are firing at a time. People used to say like, oh, well, you know, we need to like that movie Limitless, you know, you need to do this and it'll activate all your brain at the same time. Right, baby. That's called it. Yeah, that, that's called a seizure when all your neurons are firing at the same time. That's actually what that is. The limit of so, seizure, fantastic. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and I haven't heard too many people say that they were, you know, uh, thinking too clearly when they were having a seizure. Yeah, they weren't heading to the but, casino. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And just like card counting and things like that. Like, so, you know, you, you want to cycle your brain cells and you want to rest your brain cells. If you, if you don't, they die. This is, what, this is where drugs are a problem. You say that drugs kill your brain. This is because they give a dopamine response and dopamine is an excitatory molecule. It makes your neurons stay on and that can damage them and they, and they eventually die. So certain parts, certain parts of your, your brain are, are, are sensitive to dopamine and those parts are the ones that die. Mm. And you can see this on MRI. But when you're not sleeping enough and your brain's not resting enough, you're, if you get less than six hours of sleep a night on average, you're six times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. So you need to sleep. You need to rest your brain. Your brain needs a chance to re heal, heal and rebuild itself. But it can't physically rebuild the structures if it doesn't have the physical components to rebuild those structures with. And that's what fat is. That's what cholesterol is. And, and you need those from fatty meat and animal animal meat. And that's very important. And that's something that we've uh, deprived ourselves of for at least the last half century and and some people even even longer than that but mm. I ask every elderly person when I'm talking to them about this I ask them like you think back to when you were a kid did any of your grandparents ever have to go to a home did any of the older people that you knew ever have to go to a home or have dementia mm -hmm. or anything like that and they all say no now that's not a scientific model but you can look at the, you know, the, the, the rates of these things, and they were very, very low uh, prior to 1980 even. And now everyone who gets above a certain age, they're all going into homes. You know, that's a very difficult thing right now in, in the hospitals, uh, hospital systems. I, since I've been a doctor for the last nine years now, you know, I've seen nothing but, uh, you know, people waiting to be placed into uh, nursing yeah. homes and so it's, forth. It's and, absolutely rampant. Yeah. And so you yeah. have, you have like a two year waiting list for, for these things. They're so backed up. So it's, it's a big problem and mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't need to exist. It, it wasn't a problem before people think, Oh, we're just living older now. That's not true. That's not true at all. We have, we have a higher average life expectancy from birth, but we also eliminated most of the major killers in infancy. Yeah. It's you know, a deceptive stat, isn't it? Very, yeah, you know, because you know, most of the most of these things were because, like in the eighteen hundreds, oh, people only live until their thirties. That's not true. This average from birth was thirty six in eighteen fifty, but if they lived till ten years old, the average was fifty six. 
you know, and then you, you go on from there. If you made it to adulthood, you essentially live to be the same age as you do now. Actually, mm. that is according to the census data going from 1850 to 2017, which, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's very, it's, it's so difficult to compare. You think about um, people in the you know, 1800s, they also lived much more dangerous lives. You know, yeah. they, were, they were jumping on horses for transport. They mm. were, you know, if you wanted to cross an ocean, you had to take a, a ship there was the chance of like catching disease and that sort of thing, you know, outside of the high infant mortality. So it's, mm. it's not kind of like apples with apples, it's apples and oranges. No. Um, yeah, you, yeah that, that's it. You're, you're dead right. Because that's the thing. It's not that these people were dying of old age at any, at any point, you know, it's not like, yeah, you know, the average was really dying of old you didn't age. get the chance. No, exactly. You know, and you didn't have, you didn't have antibiotics, you didn't have all these sorts of things, but it is, mm. it is interesting that without all of these, you know, modern advances and, and safety measures that we have in medicines and so forth, when you got into adulthood, even back in the 1850s, you on average lived roughly the same amount of time as you do now. Yeah. Which is, without uh, all the crap that we have now. So yeah. that means that, you know, we're probably, you know, doing some major things wrong, which of course we are. We're deteriorating, but all these band-aids have been stuck on top to try and keep the sort of status quo. Um, so that we can get like a stake in the ground in the ground, Dr. Chafee. Can you kind of explain the process of what I'm going to call natural brain degradation or deterioration? So like assume that somebody is getting a, a reasonably good diet and they are getting enough sleep, um, etc. Uh, you sort of alluded to it before. I assume that as people get older, their brains do naturally um like you were saying, take up less space. They, they do naturally degrade. Can you explain that process a little bit? So, yeah, but I, I think that a lot of that has to do uh, with what we're doing wrong as, right, as yeah. opposed to just being actually actually normal. I think okay. that uh, a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, depriving ourselves of these healthy fats and uh, depriving ourselves of, uh, you know, the proper nutrition, but also exposing ourselves even, even to a small degree to things that are going to be harmful to us. So, you know, I, I always talk about, you know, plants and sugar and so forth being quite harmful to us and they, and they are, and these can cause damage to your brain, just like they can cause damage to your body. And so this is going to, this is going to degrade your brain, cause inflammation, slow down your healing process and, and make it more difficult for you to, um, for you to rebuild your brain and so forth. Uh, and most people don't get enough fat. Most of the people that, um, that do live a great age, they generally eat, are eating eggs and bacon and things like that. You look at, this is, this is anecdotal, but you know, when I, I, I every now and then uh, I'll look up you know, the diet of people who live over a hundred or the oldest people in the world and their mm. diet. And there are people that look at these things and they get the handful of people, you know, the 10, 20 people that have lived to be 110, 115, 117. I, I think every single one that I've seen, they all say bacon and eggs. Like that's the secret, <laughs> bacon and eggs. They all say it. And I remember there's one guy who was 110 years old. He was the oldest man in New York. And this guy was still living on his own, walking around New York, you know, just doing his thing, 110 years old. And they asked me, it's like, oh, you know, this is where the Mediterranean diet was really gaining popularity. It's like, oh, it must be your diet. Like, you know, what are you eating? Are you on the Mediterranean diet? And he just said, and what, said what he said was, he said, what do you eat every day? Well, every day I eat a pound of bacon and a box of Thunderbird wine. A <laughs> box of it. And like, you know, some, sometimes you get like a box of wine, actually get nice wine now. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of been, been a move. That was not the case then. Yeah. You, if you're buying wine in a box, that was, because it was sack. horrible. Yeah. It was horrible, horrible wine. And uh, anything called Thunderbird wine is just mm, not, not going to be good. Fantastic. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, well, they, they, they always say that Hong Kong has the um, oldest life expectancy and they've got the highest mm -hmm. per capita consumption of meat. So that, they do, uh, yeah. It's like it's like a pound and a half per person on average, and you you know, not everybody is an adult male. So yeah, that's you know, right. That's you're you're talking about little girls are are in, mm. are in that average, and that means that the people who are eating the most meat, which is generally going to be your oh, adult male, is going to eat a lot more than that. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, and so um, yeah, and then you, you look at um, other other sorts of things like uh, you know remember every, the, the vegans always like to trot out Okinawa and how they live a great long life and they don't eat a lot of red meat at all and they always say that always listen for qualifiers and we you know weasel words that that slightly change something to make you think you're talking about something else when you're actually not. They say uh, they don't eat a lot of red meat. That's that's true, but they eat a lot of pig. They have a lot of pigs there. They eat a lot of pork. They eat a lot of meat. And so that's not considered a red meat 
fine. It's still meat. And so even though they're eating plants, they're eating plants that, you know, they grew this, not, they're not eating a lot of processed crap. And so one of the things like the blue zone study, if you look at that, you know, you, you look at the, the studies and you ignore the conclusion that the author draws, you draw your own conclusions. And, and so the authors drew the conclusion that in these areas that are more plant-based, they lived longer and had healthier lives. Therefore, plant-based is better. But actually what they showed was that places that ate a lot less sugar and processed crap lived a lot longer. And they also excluded places like Hong Kong and so forth. Um, you know, they cherry pick these things as well, but they also got the wrong conclusion from their own data, I would say. And then you have the Eat Lancet study, which was crap. Um, you know, the top uh, epidemiologist and professor of medicine in the world, he's, he's the most cited researcher in any discipline of all time, Professor John Ioannidis from Stanford. Um, and, and citations are really how you draw, you, you measure your clout as a researcher, and he is the best researcher of all time in any field. And so, and he, he just pointed out that, you know, the, these nutritional medicine, uh, nutritional studies and so forth are, are, are all crap, basically, they're really bad. And, and he said specifically about the Eat Lancet trial that that was more science fiction than science. And it was just, you know, these people have an agenda and they'll, they will, you know, mold and manipulate whatever they can to, to meet that agenda. And so, you know, it's, um, uh, you, you, but there's other, there's other ways of looking at these things. And there's a lot of other sources of information as well. That totally. Show a completely different story. Absolutely. So we've, so far we've kind of gotten, uh, in terms of prevention, we're talking about eating a saturated mm -hmm. fat, which generally will come from um, eating meat, pork, beef, lamb, chicken, whatever it is, uh, yeah. and getting your sleep. Uh, as you mentioned, if you're getting less than six hours per night, you're six times more likely to have, I think, um, Alzheimer's or no, Alzheimer's. Yeah. Alzheimer's. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, sort of not only prevention, but the cure. Uh, have, you, have you got any anecdotes or stories about people recovering or improving their Alzheimer's and dementia um, with proper nutrition? Yeah, well, so, so like I said, you know, there was, there's an actual, there are, are actual studies, you know, using a high fat ketogenic diet as a treatment modality for Alzheimer's. And that has been shown to be more effective than anything else ever tried, basically. And so, um, you know, I, I'm trying to you know, sort of set up trials and things like that as well, just to, just to, use a carnivore diet, a high fat carnivore diet, or at least the, the uh, you know, high fat ketogenic diet, uh, as, as a, as a treatment for, uh, these sorts of people and just, and just show, just show how beneficial it is and give these people, you know, a, a new, new lease on life. And, uh, certainly family members, certainly, uh, friends and colleagues and patients that I've, that I've, um, you know, helped get on a carnivore diet. They, they benefited tremendously. You know, my father, I've, I've mentioned before, was diagnosed with Parkinson's and was slowing down and was having memory issues. And, and, you know, he, he was a, he's a brilliant man. He was, he was a physicist, mathematician, computer scientist, uh, his whole life. And, uh, you know, he was on, uh, uh, a team at the Lawrence Livermore radiation laboratory in Berkeley with Louis Alvarez, who won the Nobel prize in physics, uh, for developing the bubble chamber and cracking atoms. My, my father literally was one of the first people to crack the atom and study subatomic particles. And so his biggest fear was, was losing his faculties and as it is with a lot of people. And I was seeing this happen and it was absolutely terrifying. And he had had a, a few medical issues and so forth that had set him back. And he, he was very slow to recover from this. And he was, you know, he was sort of sitting on the couch. He was watching TV. He wasn't really talking as much. Normally he's very, very uh, conversational. He loves talking to people. He loves, um, you know, being in conversations and, and contributing. He's a very interesting guy to listen to, as you would expect. And he wasn't really able to do this. And it would, be, it would actually be days uh, would go by before I, I heard him say anything. He, you know, talked to my mom more than, than Man, that. That would have been devastating. Mm, it was, and I was, I was watching this in real time and, and aware of what was happening and, and really upset by it and, and trying to think, you know, what, what could I do? What could be done? You know, hoping that he would just sort of come out of it. And that was when around the time that I really came back to a carnivore diet and, and really realizing how significant it was that I was, you know, what I was doing, you know, 20 years earlier and really digging into the, into the re research and seeing what we, we could prove. 
And so I was, I was living like that. I was getting insane results from this. I was doing so much better. And I was, you know, looking through the data and, okay, what, and asking questions and trying to see, you know, if I could answer them in the data and, and challenging, okay, we have two opposing ideas. Let's look for, for information and, and, and evidence that can prove one of them right or wrong, or maybe both of them wrong or right uh, or wrong anyway. And I was getting really excited. I was finding new things. I was talking to my parents about it. I was like, oh, look at this and look at this and look at this and look at this. Eventually, it was enough that it interested my father, and he talked to my mom and said, "Well, let's let's try it. Let's just do it do it for a month and see how it goes." One month into this, my father was just a different person. He was just an entirely different human being. He had so much more energy. He was going around. He was talking. We were talking, having normal conversations again, and uh, and then he was telling me, um, you know, I was like, "Oh, I'm just having really bad constipation. It's just sort of having an issue." And I, I sort of realized that he was still doing things low fat or lower fat than he should uh, because he, he, he sort of grew up like, or he raised us like that on the Pritikin uh, modality of just not eating any, any fat at all. And so it was hard for him to eat fat and he just didn't, he was just still naturally doing it. I, I was even cutting fat off for myself for a while. And then I was like, no, 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 I have to eat the fat. I had to convince myself um, to do that because I was like, I trust the data. I trust this, eat the damn fat. And so I just mentioned to him, I was like, well, you know, fat is actually what drives your digestion. That's what actually keeps your stool soft. So if you're, if you're having hard constipation, that means you're not getting as much fat as your body wants because it's that excess fat that your body can't absorb that goes through and keeps the stool soft. And also it's the fat that grows your brain, re regrows your brain and, uh, and, and keeps it healthy. And so, you know, it's, it's really important to do that. And so he said, okay. And the man started eating bacon and drinking whole milk. I've never seen this man. Awesome. Drink whole milk or eat bacon in my entire life as a child or an adult. And one month after that, he made insane improvements the first month. The second month was even more. He was, he was just basically his old self again. And he was, he was still uh, a bit weakened because of the, the hospitalizations and, and, uh, and, you know, uh, deteriorating sort of, um, uh, issues that he's had and and you know he had he still had to recover from that but all of a sudden you know he's reading again he's going through his his old you know physics textbook from his phd at berkeley and he's you know he's he's you know mowing the lawn he's like taking a chainsaw and cutting down trees he was 80 right you know so like i mean i, I remember calling my brother and he was saying i asked him what he was doing he's like oh i'm just going over to mom and dad's house it's like oh okay you're just hanging out it's like well you know you know dad decided to cut down a tree with a chainsaw and yeah. was very worried so she you know she wanted me to go over there and make sure he doesn't die. I'm like, okay. All right. You know, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Chavy, question for you. When, yeah. when this change was happening, could your, could your father actually recognize it and be like, oh, I'm better this month than I was last month? Or did he just kind of naturally start doing the stuff he used to do? He, um, I, I didn't speak to him specifically about that. Um, so I, I don't know, but I'm sure he did because like, I mean, he was just, he was just a different person, you know, yeah, okay. he was an entirely different person. And, you know, he's definitely was saying that he, he felt better and was doing better and, and so forth. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't have stuck with it if he, if he didn't think that my mom was very much against it, but she, she did it to support him. And, you know, she's a big foodie. She loves cooking and she, and she was a bit grumpy that she couldn't cook all the different things that she, she used to cook. And a couple of weeks into it, I was just asking how she was doing. So while well, well, I'm just, you know, I'm, I don't feel good. I'm all tired. I'm this and that. I was like, well, you know, you're diabetic and you're on a heap of medications to keep your blood sugar down, but you're not eating any exogenous carbohydrates. So what's your blood sugar doing? And she sort of thought about it and checked it. It was actually quite low. So I'm like, well, there you go. You know I mean? You can expect to pull back on your medications if you're not, if you're not, uh, you know, taking any offending agents that, that uh, require it. And this is when she started titrating her, her diabetes, diabetes medications down. Now she's off of them. You know, she's on the lowest dose of, of uh, long acting insulin because, um, you know, she doesn't, doesn't quite uh, make enough insulin at this point. She was insulin dependent diabetic as well. And so, um, you know, they, they both noticed, you know, extreme benefits of this. And, and my mom certainly wouldn't have stayed with this if, uh, if it wasn't such a big benefit to her life. Um, yeah, my father ended up losing, I think, 60 pounds. Wow. in eight months and and was you know just running around doing all sorts of things he just started going to the gym again at 80 and um you know doing spin classes and things like that there's actually a thing called pedaling for parkinson's where you if you move your your legs very 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 fast it's just the motion you're just moving them even if somebody's moving for you if you have an automated um uh you know bike or something like that that moves your legs as long as your, your legs are moving at like you know 80 to 90 rpm um 
for about 40, 45 minutes, three days a week, this has actually shown a significant improvement on Parkinson's symptoms and it can actually reverse Parkinson's symptoms if done for eight weeks and actually maintain for another eight weeks. And so, yeah, it's very interesting. So, so he started doing that as well. Uh, once he, he felt up to it, but I was about eight months into it and he was just, he was just a completely different person. Um, you know, one reason why, you know, the ketogenic diet and a, and a carnivore diet, obviously, because, you know, ketogenic is getting closer to a carnivore diet, which is our evolved natural diet. So that's going to be the most beneficial the ketogenic diet in and of itself made a significant improvement in, uh, you know, people with Alzheimer's and so forth for a very, very simple reason. You know, we you have mentioned this before, but, um, Alzheimer's is sometimes referred to as type three diabetes because it's a, it's a, it seems to be more of a metabolic process. And when you address that metabolic process and the problems that they're in, you know, you, you can actually, uh, have, find workarounds or even reversals. So the issue with type two diabetes is that you have peripheral insulin resistance. You, you have, you're running your blood sugar so high for so long that your body's just like, okay, enough of this crap because, because glucose at high levels causes harm. And so your body is going to set up defenses against it. One of those defenses is, is to slam up your insulin. High insulin for too long causes a myriad of diseases. And so this is one of them. So when you get peripheral insulin resistance, well, your brain is part of that. And so now you're getting insulin resistance to the brain. Now the brain can't take in as much glucose, but because you're in this, this, this uh, high insulin state, you can't make all your other uh, you know, energy sources. You, can't, you don't make blood sugar, you don't make glycogen, you don't make ketones. And so you're dependent on this glucose, which now you're resistant to because you're insulin resistant. And so you start feeling like crap, your body starts getting tired, you can't exercise as well as you could have, and your brain starts slowing down, and you're not getting energy to your brain, so it actually starts to decay and decay and decay, and this is where we see these things shriveling up. And when you switch to a ketogenic diet, or preferably a carnivore diet, but really just getting rid of carbohydrates and getting your insulin down, and your body can now mobilize your fat stores and mobilize ketones. Ketones are your brain's primary food stores. I don't know where the hell this rumor went around the saying that, that your brain runs on glucose. That's what it's supposed to go on. That is crap. You know, I learned this in biochemistry 24 years ago that your brain's primary, primary energy source are ketones. You run, they run on ketones no matter what metabolic state you're in. You're always running on ketones and, you, and they run better when you're in uh, a non-insulin driven state termed the fasting state, which is bullshit. That's, that's our primary metabolic state. That's where everything works better. And so I don't know who came up with that. I don't know who said that, you know, but they're wrong and they clearly never took biochemistry. They just, they just heard something and it sounded good and they ran with it. And that's a yeah. lot of things. You know, it, 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 it does sound simple. It's like, you know, well, it, carbohydrates in, use glucose for energy, that'll fuel your brain, tick, tick, well, done. Well, but also when you're, you, you're in a, a fed, they call a fed state, you know, your brain does predominantly run on, on glucose, but that's because your body is desperately trying to get this blood sugar the hell out of your system as quickly as possible because it's damaging you. Mm. Okay. So it's, it's shoving it in everywhere. It's not just your brain. It shoves it into your fat and your muscles and your liver. It shoves it in everywhere. It's just getting it the hell out of your bloodstream because you don't want these loose particles running around causing damage. And so it, people look at that and they hear that and they go, oh, that's the end of the story. Your brain wants to run on, on glucose. Like, okay, well, first of all, you're, you know, you're assuming a fact that's not an evidence, okay? Because you're assuming that that actually is our primary metabolic state, okay? And you're assuming that we got it right, that that's a fed state and so forth. So, you know, that, that, that was a guess. And I, I would say it's very, very wrong. And so, you know, a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. So they heard like one little thing, oh, that's it, that's it. And they just ran with this. And they're like, no, 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 it can't be anything else. It's like, look, you don't know enough to realize how wrong you are. And so when you do actually take biochemistry, you take the rest of it, you find out that ketones are actually what run your brain. Your brain is always running on ketones. That's it. That's its optimal preferred and most efficacious uh, energy source. And especially when you're talking about someone who's been eating carbohydrates for a long time, even if they're not diabetic, even if they're not um, you know, having any sort of, you know, disease process that we can see, uh, very clearly 
this process is still happening. You're still getting uh, some insulin resistance, which is going to slow down the, the uptake of energy into your brain. It's going to slow your brain down over time. Your brain is going to atrophy. I think this is, this is a major part of why our brains, you know, so-called normally atrophy over time, I think because we're not maintaining it properly. So we're not maintaining it properly because we're not getting the requisite fats that they're made out of, probably not getting enough sleep, no one does. And then we're, we're eating a lot of uh, carbohydrates, even if we're not eating sugar. You know, fructose is, is worse than all of that. It causes more peripheral insulin resistance um, you know, in and of itself, regardless of, of, uh, of your blood sugar and so forth. So this causes much, much more problem. So if you're eating a lot of sugar, this is going to, is going to hit you more. And obviously there are going to be people that are genetically susceptible, uh, to these processes and they're going to be hit harder. So when you go to a carnivore diet, which is how we're supposed to be anyway, and at least a ketogenic diet, you now circumvent that blockage. Okay. Now you don't need insulin. You don't want insulin. And so it doesn't matter if you're, you're insulin resistant because your ketones are just going to go in and run your brain and your brain, you're just going to light up. Like I saw with my dad, he just, he just literally just woke up. And this is what a lot of people talk about. You know, have this, this mental clarity and they don't have the brain fog. They have a lot of different descriptors on what they feel like cognitively when they go on a ketogenic or carnivore diet. This I wonder, is Dr. Chafee, I'll jump in there. Is that, I wonder if that's a similar feeling to what people experience on intermittent fasting towards the latter, st latter mm. stage of their fast, where they've cleared out all the um, glucose and insulin from their body. Yeah, that, that's exa exactly what's happening. Yeah, because they're, you know, their insulin has dropped down to a normal level and that's where you get all the benefits. That's, that, those are the benefits of fasting in general, but intermittent fasting, um, as well, because you're just waiting out the clock on your insulin. So intermittent fasting, they do this essentially every day. And so they eat like a big meal or within a window and, and then their insulin's up generally because people are, who do that can often, uh, be just still eating a normal diet and they'll still get a lot of very good results from that yep. because they're waiting out the clock on that. And then they get into their normal state. So they are in their normal metabolic state for some periods and they feel a lot better. And that's when they work out and they have boundless energy and they're running marathons and so forth. And they have one full fast day a week. Generally, this is in the traditional intermittent fasting modality. And that's when they feel the best. And that's when they're doing all their, that's when they plan their marathons on their fast day and so forth. And that's exactly what's happening. You're, you're letting your metabolism get back to normal. You're letting your body actually run efficiently and effectively and just generate energy and, and, you know, run properly. And that's the amazing thing about your body is if you just leave it alone, it generally does a good job. You know, I don't, I don't understand why people think that we need to micromanage our biochemistry. What animal can possibly do that in the wild? You know, you just, you just eat naturally and your body takes care of the rest. If it didn't, we wouldn't be here. You know, like we didn't have the technology and the ability and the understanding that we do now to, to try and micromanage our biochemistry and our bodies and our blood sugar and so forth. So, you know, that, that wouldn't have, wouldn't have been, a, uh, that wouldn't have been a survival uh, trait mm. and, you know, and people saying that, you know, and, and also, you know, we, we all, we do have more technology. Now we do have more knowledge, but, you know, you get to the point where you, you know, you're so sharp, you'll cut yourself because we've looked at all these sorts of things and said, oh, oh, I know exactly what's going on here and you're dead wrong. And you end up going down a very, very different track and you start, you know, start ignoring the thousands of years of accumulated knowledge that told us to do the exact opposite of what we were doing. And, you know, and sometimes those accumulated you know, pieces of knowledge are, are based in something that's not right, but a lot of it is, has to do with, with, with trial and error and seeing what actually works in a practical practical setting. Yeah, I think, I think what you're describing there is like sort of a very simple and intuitive way of eating. Um, but, yeah. you know, it's hard to create 10 different products around that. And, you know, <laughs> a lot of the sort of like, you know, overthinking and like, you know, bullshitizing if that's a word of you know the human <laughs> body and like you know all the the crashes and then you need this sugary product to pick you back mm -hmm. up and then you need this caffeine gel before you exercise and then you need to carbo load yeah. the night before and all this stuff i mean really it's i think it's just productizing your health and you know you might do all these hundreds of things and get close to what you would do a, you know experience if you just sort of ate intuitively you ate a more or, you know, a natural or ancestral diet mm. um, and, you know, actually experience a little bit of hunger, a little bit of intermittent fasting. 
That's quick. Yeah, That's I nice. mean, you, yeah, you can. I mean, you know, there's, there's, um, I, I don't think there's anything. I, I don't think there's anything necessarily that provides more benefit once you're already in your proper metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, yeah. It's hard to say because That's I, haven't, I haven't really seen any study, and maybe maybe they exist, and I just haven't seen them. And um, and maybe this this happens, even though I don't I don't know. I mean, you can't you can't, I, you can't prove a negative just because I haven't seen this information doesn't mean that information doesn't exist. But I haven't seen personally anything that convinced me that, that you get much more from just not eating at all versus not eating carbohydrates and being in a so-called fasting state. Um, the, the studies that have shown a lot of um, benefit have been in the context of a sad diet, of the standard American diet, standard Australian diet, where you, your Western diet, which is crap. And so you're, you're not eating crap and all of a sudden you're better and you're in, a, you're in the so-called fasting state and you get these benefits. I don't, and we, we think of that because, oh, when you're fasting, you're not eating and now you're in this fasting state and you get these benefits. Okay. But you know, you're supposed to be in that metabolic state and you get a lot of benefits from being in that metabolic state. And you're always going to be in that metabolic state if you're eating as a carnivore or even ketogenic. And so they even have a lot of studies because they've seen that a, 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 you know, in a fasted state, you get all these benefits. You, in, in animal models, they can regrow beta islet cells in the pancreas and, and reverse type one diabetes and then start making insulin again, reverse type two diabetes and a ton of other things, you know, reverse Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, tons and tons of these studies. And, and yet there's a, well, you know, you don't really want to just not eat anything. That's really hard, especially for these long periods of time, because you know, it would take like four days, five days in a row every month in order to do that. And so like, well, that's really hard for people. So we'll come up with a fasting mimicking diet. And there's a ton of studies looking at a fasting mimicking diet, which is ketogenic diet, right? And it may not even be full carnivore, but it's at least ketogenic because it's putting you in that fasting state and they find the same benefits. So they find that, you know, that, that, you know, fasting these mice, you get, you, you can regrow beta islet cells and reverse type two diabetes. And they find the exact same results if you just don't give them carbs. And so that's what I've been seeing. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm sure there's, there's more to learn out there about, you know, what happens when you're just actually not eating food and, and what that does for you. But I haven't seen uh, anything that's made me think that there's more benefit to not eating at all versus just eating a carnivore diet. Mm. Anyway, I mean, I'm, yeah. and again, I'm just, I'm saying that out of my own ignorance, like it, it, there may be a benefit, but I haven't, I haven't seen much of it myself. So I don't, I don't um, recommend people if they're on a full carnivore diet, you know, to fast. So you just, just eat what your body tells you. Your body knows what it's doing. And if you eat, again, like you say, intuitively, you eat the meat and well, it tastes good and it stops tasting good, as I've said before, because when your body wants these nutrients, they taste better. And then when it's, and when it's had enough, they don't taste as good. Mm -hmm. And so your body just naturally just goes, Ugh, I don't want to eat this anymore. And you, you naturally want to stop. You can keep force feeding yourself, but you really do have to force yourself. It really becomes. I mean, Dr. Shafi, based on the the carnivores that I've spoken to, like new people trialing it and seasoned carnivores, mm -hmm. pretty much everyone, if not everyone, sort of intuitively does some form of sixteen eight intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's that's what I do. Like I have my first meal around twelve or one o'clock, and that's just what feels good. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've mentioned before, often you'll only eat once a day. Well, you know, somebody would turn around and say, hey, that's intermittent fasting. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose at carn on carnivore, generally people just eat that way because that's what feels right. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I put the distinction on it because, you know, what I consider fasting is to, it is, is knowingly depriving yourself of food uh, when, okay. you right. when you're actually hungry. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. I don't, I don't, unless I'm, I'm stuck at the hospital and I, I just literally can't get away and get food. I eat when I'm hungry. Yeah, me too. You know? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, when you're eating high density nutrition, especially with the high fat content, you're just going to be satiated longer and you're not going to yeah. eat as much. And so, you know, you'll get into that, that pattern anyway, when I'm working out a lot and lifting weights a lot, I will naturally want to eat more. And so, you know, I'll, I'll eat a lot, I'll eat like, you know, big steak until I'm full. And then the next day I sort of wake up, I'm like, damn it, I want, I want another one, you know, and then I'll go and I'll eat again. And so I'll eat sometimes, you know, twice a day, um, you know, without a, without a problem. 
I don't have any problem with that. Um, but I don't, I don't specifically say I'm only going to eat during this window, but I naturally yeah, yeah. do. And a lot of, and a lot of people do. And so, you know, and some, a lot of people ask me that as well, you know, oh, should you be fasting? Should you do intermittent fasting? And I'm like, well, you don't need to, but you probably will naturally end up doing that anyway. And if you're, unless you're, especially when you're losing weight, when you have a lot of excess body fat, um, and that you're trying to lose, you, you're probably not going to be hungry more than once a day anyway, if you eat until you're full. And that's certainly uh, what I've noticed in myself and with patients and so forth that are losing weight is that, you know, the body has an, a, a surplus, um, an abundant surplus of energy. Like you really don't need uh, much at all to maintain yourself. You know, there was a guy uh, in England, it was very, it was very interesting uh, individual. He was very overweight. I think he was I knew something, something around 300 kg, um, very, very large guy. I mean, he was, you know, he was a ham sandwich away from being bedridden, you know, and um, he just decided, he just sort of looked around and actually made a pretty, pretty clever, intuitive uh, connection, which is he's a mammal and there are a lot of mammals out there that hibernate for the winter and they don't, they don't have problems. You know, they don't die of malnutrition. They don't, you know, have, you know, you know, lose out on vitamins and so forth they actually do very very well and they, they build up all this fat and then they use that as they hibernate through the winter and so he said fine i'm just going to do that and he just stopped eating and he was drinking water and he would take a multivitamin every day just for good measure i don't even know if he necessarily needed that but he took it and um he uh, checked his doctor, he went to his doctor every month and got a blood, you know, set of blood tests and so forth. And his doctor kept going like, yeah, you know, everything's looking good on this end. And so he kept doing this. He did this for nine months. What? <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. So he stopped eating. He did not eat food for nine months. And he walked and he, you know, he started getting increasing his activity as well. He would walk to work and so forth, which was, you know, a couple miles. And so he walked to work every day. He only drank water. He took a vitamin and he didn't eat for nine months. He said after like a, a few days. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the thing is, is that, you know, he said after a few days, he wasn't even hungry. He didn't even feel hungry. Now that's, you know, I talk about a lot, you know, your yeah. hunger signals are very, very different and they change. And so, yeah, he didn't feel hungry like he normally would because he was eating carbohydrates and sugar, which made his brain think that he was starving to death. Leptin. Yeah, exactly. And so now his brain could see that he had a, ton of leptin so, <laughs> 200 know, kilos. Yeah, exactly <laughs> extra 200 kilos of leptin and so he was fine and so his brain wasn't sending out panic signals and so he was drinking water and he was doing great he lost he, he got down to a relatively normal weight after about nine nine and a half months the craziest part about that is that his skin shrunk with him so he didn't have all these bags of extra skin which is what you normally see when people have rapid weight loss that's probably unhealthy or surgically uh, driven. What's your what What's your take on that? Uh, just the, that that he was onto something. That you know, this is a natural process, and your body can survive in in, in sort of a hibernation mode, and it and will just skin, and it will yeah, it will come down with it. it yeah, yeah. No. I mean, you know, he's not going to reverse his his stretch marks and things like that. Yeah, but yeah. like the but the skin came down; it wasn't all baggy. Uh, and, and hanging off of him, um, you know, if you're if you're starving yourself, um, you know, in certain ways, and, and you're really malnourished, you know, uh, you know, you you would expect you'd have these sorts of things, but you know, we didn't really see that. You know, people in concentration camps, you know, they had skin stretched tight against their bones, you know, and then so it wasn't like they they had just skin hanging off of them. Normally, you see that when people are taking you know amphetamines or something. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting gastric surgery and so forth, or a ton of liposuction and, yeah. um, Interesting. and, uh, you know, and taking just a bunch of stimulants and amphetamines, which was, which was a mainstay of, of, uh, diet and weight loss medicine, which was complete crap. I mean, the real, the, the real doctors who actually have really helped people have always stayed well away from, from that. Um, you know, the Did I, I, I tell you that's what, I, I think his ketosis experience would have been unreal. Because yeah. like you, you're literally burning the fat straight off your body, and then your brain's being fueled by that. I reckon he would have been in a deep state of like yeah. mental clarity. I wonder what. Yeah, it would be so good to speak to him. We should track him down. Like imagine, oh, yeah. um, like his. That would be yeah. Yeah, we should, we'll find him. His sleep. Yeah. Like I'm curious about that. I'm like, well, who's hibernating? Just like a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> like a bear yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Dude, I reckon either he slept all the time or he just didn't need to sleep. Uh, I can't imagine it was yeah. just like normal life. No, I, th- I think he, I think he probably, you know, probably ended up needing less sleep, requiring yeah. less sleep, and getting better quality sleep. I reckon, which is, which is what you, you tend to see, and and yeah, I, I think he did, he did just fine. You know, he obviously did just fine. He's oh, yeah, it was he didn't fun. die after nine months of not eating. No, you know, and he didn't have really any problems from the sounds of it. You know, I obviously haven't looked into all the nitty gritty of, of, of the story and I haven't seen his bloods, but from, from the account that I read, he was seeing a doctor every month. He was getting his blood taken every month and every month his, his doctor was happy. Mm, and he felt great. And then he dropped, I think he yeah, dropped something like, yeah, 200 kilos in nine months. Mm. And uh, yeah. And uh, it's doing, was, was much better for it from the sounds of it. Yeah. Okay. We're going to end with something that's um, a bit out there and a bit taking a punt, but lay it on us, Dr. Chafee, you're eating strict carnivore. You've been doing strict carnivore for four years. You know, lots of people who are also doing strict carnivore. Let's talk longevity. Mm -hmm. How long, how long do you think you can, you can be on planet earth alive? Oh, I'm on a, I'm on a 120, 130 year, uh, time frame at the moment that's how i think about it you know so people, yeah so you know um you look at you know genetically we know as geneticists for the last 20 years or so that we are designed chromosomally to live 120 years on average right so that means if you just stay out of your own way and just don't mess up you should make it to 120 without doing anything special and this is something that we see in native populations and so forth native americans native australians uh you know different peoples all around the world still living as carnivores this is this is what they still say and they, what they still see they are not put it into the you know the eat lancet and the blue zone studies though of course because uh you know they'll all they'll always say oh we don't have like you know official government record we can't you know trust their records and so forth i'm like that's fine you don't need to yeah. um but uh you know and as i as i mentioned uh in previous things you know there's a just you know herodotus who's the father of history in ancient, ancient greece you know he chronicled a, uh interaction between an emissary from persia who just like taken over egypt at that time with their now neighbor uh, ethiopia and the king of ethiopia and, and the king of ethiopia asked the persian emissary um, how, you know, what, what do you people eat and how long do they normally live? And, and the, the person, you know, explained growing wheat and making bread, uh, because this was not something that the Ethiopians did, which not many people around the world did at that time. And then they said they, they generally live around 70 years. And again, you know, this is, this is again, looking at the bullshit of, of all oh, people died in their thirties and so forth. Socrates was in his seventies causing trouble around Athens, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, they had to kill him. You know, and so, um, you know, people did actually live, live to these, these ages and so forth. And so, and again, we have this, this documentation, however, you know, if you want to trust it or not, that's what they said, uh, living to, to be 70. And then the king of Ethiopia just sort of laughed at him and just said, you know, uh, you know, no wonder you guys live such short lives. If you all eat dirt, you know, our, you know, our people eat, you know, just boiled meat and drink and only drink the milk of our cattle. And, you know, we would live 120 years. Sometimes some people would live even longer than that. So it sounds far-fetched. It sounds braggadocious and and an exaggeration, but it is exactly what geneticists have shown us to be our, you know, perceived genetic life expectancy on the nose. You know, we're saying like scientists right now are saying we should live 120 years. And he was saying, we live 120 years, you know, on the damn nose. Mm. And so, you know, if he was saying that, oh yeah, you know, we live 280, 500 years, something like that. You'd be like, you'd be like uh, you're exaggerating, yeah. You know, but he got, he nailed it on the head, you know? Mm. And so, I mean, and you, there are a ton of other, other people's like this, you know, there's, um, you know, I did a post about this as well. Um, you're talking about the Native Americans and, you know, we had, we had, uh, you know, census data on this in the 1800s talking about how they lived to be 110, 115 years old, you know, living out in the wild on the prairies, you know, following the buffalo herd. So sick. And, yeah. And, and, you know, and they were fine, hale and hearty, you know, not just like, you know, sitting in the back of a nursing home, turning to dust for 40 years, you know, just hating their life, maybe not even realizing they're still alive. You know, some of these people don't have the quality of life that you would, you would hope that they would. 
these guys did, you know, they were still out there. They're still, you know, married. They still had their wife, you know, had their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, their great, great grandchildren and so forth. And that, that's, that is, that is a life well lived right there. Mm. And, you know, we saw this and, and we saw people living to that age and, and these, these accounts of them living to exactly what we would expect them to live at genetically if they were living a normal biologically appropriate life which they were, they were living as carnivores. And so we, we've lost that, you know, that insight, but that's what they were doing. And that's exactly why they lived that long. The, the longest lived uh, Native American on record um, lived something like, I think it was 137 years. Wow. You know, and so he was born in the, you know, the 17, late 1700s and he died in the early 1900s. I mean, this guy saw a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And probably stuck to his natural diet too that yeah well yeah well you know he, you would expect him to he would have had to really i mean if you're going to make it that long this guy wasn't yeah. wasn't uh uh you know dipping into the the western food uh, as much as other people would. No way. and you know and, and that's the thing too you know i've said before what you know uh what i learned as a kid that native americans went on a western diet are four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. And I remember thinking at the time, like, well, doesn't that mean the food is causing the disease? You know, because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease. We just get it at a lower rate. You know, and what, what, what's a, what's a Western, what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? And they, yeah, they didn't say that at the time, but they were full on a carnivores, high fat carnivores. And that's, and that's very important, you know, being on a high fat carnivore diet, obviously the meat and fat are, are your basic nutrients, especially the fat that's very important for you and, and explicitly excluding all these harmful elements that are going to cause all sorts of harm. You know, the, 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 you know, the alpha and the omega being sugar and carbohydrates, these, these cause just insurmountable damage in our bodies and our brains and the rest of them screw us too but i think that the massive prevalence of these so-called chronic diseases today are mostly driven by sugar and carbohydrates driving up our insulin and having that just completely derail our metabolic system and if this was our primary metabolic state this was our primary biochemical uh, state, why would it, you know, just cause us to break down and die in such fabulous ways, you know, that, so that again is more evidence why that's not our, our primary metabolic state. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Dr. Chafee, 120 years, heard it here first. Oh, at least, yeah. at least I think probably, yeah. Well, I mean, cause I, well, you get to 120 if you don't mess up. Yeah. Right. And, you and know, if you do extra exercise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, I plan on being, you know, yeah. on, on the other side of that. And there's other, those sorts of very interesting things scientifically coming up. You know, people have, uh, yeah, that's true. uh, you know, like uh, different sort of, uh, you know, NAD infusions and so forth. They find that this, this can potentially add on uh, telomeres onto your chromosomes. Telomeres are the caps on your chromosome. And as you, every time you split and you change and go, they, they cleave these off, they cleave these off, they cleave these off. That's just a, just a stopwatch on your life. You know, that's mm. your hourglass in death's hands and when that that runs out you know that's it for those cell lines and you just start you just start popping off um there is a, there's a, at least suggestions and i've heard people saying that they're they're um doing experiments and so forth and there's early early evidence to suggest that uh giving these nad uh infusions like iv can actually add telomeres or sorry telomeres uh exercise does this does this as well you know, when you're, when you're pushing yourself hard at the gym and you're doing hard sprints and you're doing hill sprints and you're lifting heavy weights and doing squats, you increase your uh, growth hormone production you, uh, and, and you can actually start adding on telomeres as well. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to benefit your life and add to the, the quality and quantity of your life as well. And that's, uh, that's one of them. And I think we're just going to keep getting more and more advances and really figuring out how to manipulate our bodies in certain ways and, and to help longevity. And if you're, if you have the building blocks of living biologically appropriately, those things are all just going to be absolute gravy and, and, and really help you out. So I think that, um, I think 130 is, is a fair, 
is a fair estimation. Maybe, maybe more. Who knows? No, we can keep doing this for a lot longer. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just to, just to add to what Dr. Chafe is saying, from my from my experience, like reading and talking to people, often the people who are kind of like thought leaders or ambitious or really achieving things, they can have a real perspective on time. And they don't get caught in the, okay, I can only see one year into the future or one year into the past. And like, for example, uh, in like old interviews with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which you might've seen too, Dr. Chafee, he talks about like when he was young and getting going, he would like plan his life out like five, 10, 20, 30 years in advance. And yeah. when I speak to like you or Dr. Pran, you guys are able to look back like 200 years, 400 years, 500 years, but then also project into the future. Because you know, where we are right now is just a moment in time. Yeah. And, you know, if we, if all goes according to plan, we're going to be here for another 80, 90 years. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, and that, that's what I think of, you know, that's why, you know, most people, you know, they get to, you know, middle age um, or what they think of as middle age was traditionally thought to be middle age. And they go like, oh my God, half my life is gone. Yeah, and, that, and, I was, and that was the good half. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I was just going to be, and you know, it went way too quick and it's, and it's, it's going to suck from here as well. You know, I, I'm not on that, that, that timeline, you know, I'm on a very different timeline. You know, if I'm going to 120 years conservatively. Did you just you know, getting started? I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm in my first third. I'm in, I'm in the prime of my, I'm in my adult prime right now. And I feel, and I feel it, you know? And so you know, I, you know, middle age is, is the, you know, is the, is your, the actual midpoint of your expected, you know, uh, life expectancy. And so, you know, if you're going on 120 year scale, then, you know, 60. middle age isn't until you're 60. Yeah, um, yeah. If you're going to 130, 140, you know, it might be a little more than that. So uh, I've got, you know, plenty of prime left. And so I, I just, yeah, I look, you know, I look forward to having a very long career, as a doctor and as a surgeon and, and doing this for many, 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 many decades and really enjoying myself Love and, it, man. and uh, you know, and, and raising a family and, and, you know, passing it on to my kids and helping them do the same, you know? So I, I have a, I have a long outlook ahead and this is something that, you know, I'm really happy about with my own parents that are getting older is that, you know, I think that this is easily going to add decades to their life. And that, that makes me really happy because they're very, very important to me. You know, totally. you know, hopefully everyone's loved ones are family members. Well said. All right, Dr. Chavy, thanks so much for today. That was an epic yeah. chat. Um, I'm sure everyone's going to get a lot of takeaways from that. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it was great. Cool, man. All right, thanks. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys.